How can we have radical self-awareness? That's what we're going to talk about today. Self-awareness is a trait, or maybe a practice is the more accurate way to put it, that everyone can always improve at it. It is part emotional intelligence, part perceptiveness, part critical thinking. It means knowing your weaknesses, of course, but it also means knowing your strengths and what motivates you. Neil Blumenthal. Today, we're going to talk about being essential, seven questions for living and leading with radical self-awareness by Dane Dunstan. The idea, he says, is that we can be the leaders of our own mind. His main point is about finding what he calls our essential self is really important because when we understand who our essential self is, we, we go places. We, we know the direction we're supposed to go or where we're supposed to be. And I think, too, we don't get swayed by other people trying to answer that question for us. I think a lot of times we meet people in our lives, whether it's at work or friends or family, that tries to tell us who we are, try to put us in some kind of a box. I knew someone who got put in a box once. And I think a lot of people from early in her life saw her in one way and never realized that she has bloomed into something else entirely. And they just saw her as the old person she used to be more like as a kid. But her learning, her experience brought her out. Like I said, bloomed her like a flower. And sometimes people can try to sit there and tell you who you are. And you're like, no, you know, that's not really me anymore. I could see, even with my own self, people coming to me and saying, well, Jill, this is who you are. You're this person. I used to be the person who looked for dirty jokes to tell because all my friends in grade school snickered at them. I used to be the person who said the radical thing because I wasn't religious. I didn't have like a family structure. I, I said things to shock people. I'm not that person anymore. I used to be the person who couldn't get anything done in her life, couldn't go in any direction in her life, couldn't get anywhere. And honestly, I didn't really want to go anywhere. I wanted to sit on my couch, watch movies and play video games. So that's exactly where I went. Not that person anymore either. So once we can figure out who our new essential self is, there's just no stopping us. He said, on one side, we're not different from anybody else. We have the same problems. We have some traits. We have challenges like everyone else does. For the most part, people have the same thoughts about what is going on in the world today, what our systems are, particularly if we come from the same country or the same culture. We're the same species, but we're also very unique individuals. Quote, like the mockingbird with his own unique collection of songs. You're just like all the other mockingbirds, meaning we have our own way to it. We have our own path to it. I do believe, because of my faith, that God created us with individual skills, talents, gifts. We are a unique creation made with what is computer code in our DNA and our experiences that are not like other people. I do believe that we are unique, even though we share a cultural, a country, a city, a town, we stare in those experiences, those problems, and those benefits together. But he says that once we learn to figure out what song we choose to sing, that's what's going to make us different, and that's what's going to make us better. And that's what I liked about this book right from the very onset. He says that once we can figure out who we are, then we have the choices that we can change in the direction that goes in the way that fits who we are. He's going to ask in this book some very key questions about who we are trying to get to that essential self. And he says that we're never going to end up running out of questions. And I believe that's true. We are question boxes. We are people who ask questions all the time. As a kid, I drove my parents crazy with questions. Why is the sky blue? Why is it like this? Why is it like that? I was full of questions all the time, but we can keep coming up with questions asking ourselves this and keep going through this pattern he gives so we understand more about ourselves and really with this self-awareness what it is that we're supposed to be doing. I think the same thing is true. I've heard Rick Warren say it a million times about finding out what your gifts are, finding out the thing you're good at. I give a presentation at this college where I say, you got to find out the thing you're good at and go do that thing, helping other people in the way that you're good at. 
he's just talking about the same thing about having this awareness. You don't know what you're good at. And I think in a sense, that was my problem in my 20s. I didn't know what I was good at. I knew for sure what I was bad at. <laughs> that I was very aware of. But what was I good at? I didn't feel good at anything, to be honest. I didn't know my place in this world, where I could change the world, where I could make it better. And that's what he's talking here, the, this self-awareness to recognize ourselves so that we can go through and start using them to help other people and change the world. He says if we know all this stuff, not only can we change the way we think, but we change how we think because we understand our path, I think, better. I am a big fan of knowing who you are and spending a little bit of time to understand it. I wonder if half the problems that we face with, like getting our goals, we have other people's goals. We want to be famous or we want to be beautiful or we want this or that. And we see other people have those goals. We see other people cherish something or want to go down this direction or down that direction. I'm not even talking about careers, I'm just talking about the way you want to go in life, the things that you want to do. You don't even know what that is. I didn't know what it was. Do I want to get married? The guy I was seeing was talking about having eight kids. I don't think we could afford eight kids, but I mean, that was one path. Another path for me was going to grad school. Another path for me was going to go and become this computer nerd. I didn't even know what path to take. I was just lost. I had a general idea of the direction I wanted to go, but without taking a serious look at me, my gifts, and what it is I really want, I was just not going in any direction at all. He says that the point is, is that whatever we love, that's what we are, whatever we go after. He calls another part of us a synthetic self. That's the part that's not even us. It's not really us. It's this other thing, this creation that I thought of the things I wanted to get into life were a synthetic feeling. It was taking away from what I probably really wanted, but I thought this was a goal I could get. This is a goal I could achieve. I could still play my video games and do all my things. and have a pretty happy life. That was sort of generically my goal. And just do these things, which is to work, pay my bills, try to figure out how to have a decent retirement. It was just all very generic, synthetic. Now I have a good idea, a solid idea of what I really want. And that's the most important thing. He gives a quote from Anne Lamott. Your problem is, how are you going to spend this one odd and precious life you have been issued? Whether you're going to spend it trying to look good, creating the illusion that you have power over people and circumstances, or whether you're going to taste it, enjoy it, and find out the truth of who you are. In the end, I think that that's what he's hoping that you get in this book is for you to do this. For me, it's also more built into my faith. I want to find out who God made me to be and what God wanted me to do on this planet. And that's now my goal. And I think in a sense, this is what it is too. The other quote he gives, and I thought this was fascinating, it comes from Abraham Maslow. There's a Maslow's hierarchy. It basically says these are the things that you need to survive. It starts out with food, water, shelter, and then gets into fulfillment and other things. But he says the story of the human race is a story of men and women selling themselves short. Wow. So that's really the fundamental part of this book is coming and facing those things so we can figure out who we are. It says, well, why in the world does it even matter to, for us to find out who we are or where we're going or what it is we're trying to do? And he said it's important, again, because it shows us the direction, but it's going to change how we live the rest of our lives. And he said that you can spend some time right now talking about your, he, what he calls your essential child. These moments where that essential child, he says, was waving at us. What, what time of the day was it? Where were you? What did you see? What did you remember feeling and thinking? That inner child, he says, is resilient in us and is waiting for us to remember. He says that if you don't remember something, it's okay. When I think about me as a child, what did I want? Well, I got dragged to Chicago all the time. I hated it. I wanted to be up in the North Woods camping. 
hanging out with my friends, exploring nature. Instead, I was in a city. So I spent every opportunity I could going to the library and reading about the world, learning something, going to the zoo, going to the park, and also sometimes museums. I went to the planetarium in Chicago. I went to the Field Museum. So I guess my essential child was telling me, I want to learn. I want to grow. I want to know everything about the world around me. But I also want to be sitting with trees and animals. That's where I'm really at home. And it's true for me now. I am most at home in the forest. It feels like when I go to a forest, it's lush and green and full of trees and rivers. That's exactly where I went camping with my friend. I'm at home. That's my essential childhood right there. So it's not so bad, right? But I think sometimes, too, when we're kids, and this is why I worry about this exercise, we lack imagination. We don't know where in the world we could go or what the world is out there. We learn things later as adults that we had no idea as children we could get there too. So I like the essential child because he says it's going to be our guide to helping us remember who we are. But I also think that if you don't resonate with that child, it's okay too. But I like the idea of what makes you that level of excitement that you just want to live. What is it that is the core of you that makes you feel the most alive. And for me, it's learning something or it's being in nature. That has never changed. That was a good wrap up, right? So we're going to go ahead and end this right here. My challenge to you is to think about either the essential child idea or what it is that just winds you up, that makes you feel like a child. Something that maybe you learned later in life, but it just gives you that internal buzz and write it down. Again, he gives the questions. Where are you? What's it like? What's your memory? What do you see? What do you feel? Write that down as your essential child. And we'll go on next time talking about his questions now to get to our essential self. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember, subscribe, tell a friend, and you're always welcome, if you want, to buy me coffee. There's a buy me coffee links in the show notes. If you want and you find something valuable in this podcast, go ahead and buy me coffee. I mean, a couple of coffees if you want. Eh, You can just buy me one coffee. That's okay, too. I appreciate you being out there. If you have anything to say to me about the podcast, a topic, something that would help you more, you're always welcome to email me at jill at startwithsmallsteps.com. And remember, our walk to finding our essential being starts with small steps and our essential child.